Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience. You know, it wouldn't be a webinar without some technical issues to get, get us started. Um, just some quick housekeeping for those of you who just hopped on. If you could please put yourself on mute when you're not speaking, um, that would be great to reduce background noise. Um, you can post any questions or comments in the chat and we'll either get to them during the meeting or we can get to them at the very end. Uh, we designed this to be a shorter update so that we could have some more room for discussion. Um, just making sure there's nothing critical in the chat. All right. All right. And so again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have some great news to share uh, tonight about the project's process, um, including some changes to where and how we're working to restore a kelp forest at Tinker's Reef. And so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Casey Cooper. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for G2KR. I'm a graduate student at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, and I am a dive master in training at the Bamboo Reef Dive Shop and I'll be helping Keith to run the meeting tonight. So next slide, Keith. Great, so for our agenda, um, we'll start off with a brief overview of the project. So for those of you who are new, uh, welcome, but also uh, we won't be doing such an in-depth overview of the project. Um, so I encourage you to check out our website or the Facebook page if you wanna learn more about the background or how the project came to be. And so after that, Keith will walk us through the current progress on Taker's Reef, as well as um, some new focus areas for urchin culling. And then I'll go over how you all can get involved, um, which includes some incentives and fun prizes. And so with that, I will go ahead and hand it off to Keith, the project leader that you guys all know so well. Well, thank you everybody. And, and thank, you, thank you all for helping to for us to celebrate the team's progress and uh, for us to describe the next phase of the project, which we can now begin due to the progress we've already made by our volunteer divers. So let's review the, the Tankers Reef project goals. First goal is do this safely. Second, train divers to call urchins properly without harming other marine life. Very important. Reduce the purple and red urchin density below two per square meter in the treatment area and to communicate data uh, to marine resource managers. We wanna show that recreational divers can come together in a responsible and ethical manner. And we are working to earn the trust of authorities so that we can get permission to expand into marine protected areas in the future. So we have bonus goals for the project and the bonus goals are to establish a giant kelp forest at Tankers Reef, provide a giant kelp spore bank for future kelp forest recovery, and monitor changes in the kelp forest community. In this map, you can see the red perimeter that is the Tankers Reef area. And that's where the kelp restoration divers have been working on this side and on the cable grid is our object. So the mustard color in this drawing, like a mustard stain, is where kelp has been uh, shown to, uh, known to have grown in the past, in the past 30 years, actually. So that's a good reference. So the stars show uh, where the easiest access is to come out to our project area. And the one with the circle around it is the one that most divers have been using. That's the one at Park Avenue. And that's the one we use for our meetup. The little figures here are where there are restrooms uh, along the shoreline here. And we hope all our work is gonna help make this kelp forest thrive again. So this is an illustration of how the current progress is on Tankers Reef. So we began working on the 100 by 100 meter grid in April. The density of urchins was initially seven per square meter. And our studies at Lover's Point show that urchins must be reduced to less than two per square meter in order for kelp to reestablish and survive. So this pink blob that you see in the image here shows where a five acre kelp forest established next to the grid in June. And the white area outside of the kelp is made up of urchin barrens and rock and sand. And 
Urchins don't like moving across sand, uh, but they will if they detect some kelp or something on the other side of it. So, um, you know, we've been seeing a lot of hungry urchins moving into this area from outside of the area. So, and they tend to run with their own species. So there's mostly red urchins, mostly purples on these locations and reds coming in this way. Now, this is what happened in August. So in August, we took another look at it and we were able to establish uh, on the north and southeast of the grid, we established some kelp on the, on the north side and on the south side um, by us going and protecting that kelp on the grid. Now, the stippled area here, these little dots that you see, are areas where we went around outside of the grid and outside of the kelp forest and went specifically after urchins that were eating the live kelp in these areas. So that's what you see with these stipple areas uh, all around here. And, and what happened too is that we lost some kelp over on the east side of the site. And we were busy on the grid over here. And in that time, the kelp on the, the east side of the site was lost. But the, uh, our efforts have been help to have kelp reestablished on the north part of the grid and down here south of the grid. It expanded into these areas as we were working on them and clearing out the urchins. So presently the kelp is thinning and it's losing its fronds and there's a lot of encrusting bryozoan. It's called a membranopora. It's a, a moss animal, it's bryozoan. Uh, which is, is encrusting the, the algae. And so you look at it, it's a stipe with some nematocysts and uh, no fronds on it at this point. And, you know, that, that bryzoan encrusting, it causes it to degrade. And once that uh, food source is gone for the urchins and the urchins are in the kelp forest, living in cracks, living off the detritus that is normal, that is in that, under that canopy, then once that food is, source is gone, they'll just come out of the cracks and eat the live kelp and go for the whole fast. So uh, we need to go into this kelp forest and clear all the urchins out of it, um, or this kelp will be lost over the winter. So we're gonna concentrate our efforts so, on these other areas. So the last urchin calling within the grid was completed in early September. And if you recall, if you recall, our, our goal uh, was to reduce the urchin population to less than two per square meter. Through hundreds of hours of work and many, many dives, kelp restoration divers were able to reduce the urchin population to an estimated one per square meter on these areas. So congratulations and thank you. And you know, we have called the urchins to a satisfactory level. And Reef Check and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the Department of Fish and Wildlife are now surveying the grid to reevaluate our work and to hope, and we're hoping to see if their data in probably a couple weeks, they come back with that. So our efforts are continuing at Tankers Reef outside of the grid, and we're starting to work on the orange buoy more than before. The orange buoy, which is currently positioned west of the grid, um, it's been there for a little while. The instructors will take their students to the orange buoy for training, and that's where certified kelp restoration divers will be working to reduce the urchin population. Whenever divers are able to clear the area of urchins along the 100 meter tape, then we will move the buoy to a new location. Instructors and kelp restoration divers will be notified of the new location of the buoy through the assignment portal. So as I noted earlier, we are taking a break from work on the grid while ReCheck and National Marine Sanctuary surveyors collect data on our progress. Eventually we will need to return to the grid to work as urchins move in from the surrounding barrens. But we are now beginning to focus on our restoration efforts on the orange buoy which is situated within the kelp forest. Like the grid, this buoy is for certified kelp restoration divers only. Untrained divers are able to work in the area around the gray buoy. So 
So there are some key differences between diving on the orange buoy and the grid. When divers who send on the buoy line, they will follow a hundred meter tape to their assignment. So their assignment will tell them to head east or west. And it's just like working on the grid that the dive teams uh, have no actual boundary lines marking the sides of their lanes. It's just an imaginary line. And you're gonna to have to uh, work on it um, in such a way that you use your compass more and try to stay in that same heading as you go along. And so you're gonna be thorough and um, as you go through this and don't worry about the distance that you travel along the line. So the cold urchin carcasses versus the uncalled urchin areas define the areas needing to be called. So don't waste a lot of effort in calling dead urchins, but do clean up the surviving urchins that others had missed. But we wanna be careful not to harm other critters or to chisel and break off shale fragments and, and really take our time and, and, and be thorough. So when you're through with the orange buoy, you know, stop when you or your buddy is getting low on air, ascend with a surface marker buoy or swim to the orange buoy and ascend on the line for safety and return to the surface with at least 500 PSI. First goal, safety. So this is our current progress on the reef. So uh, we're 224,000 urchins and, and this is cumulative. This is on the grid and off the grid. Right, 224,000 urchins are estimated to have been called at 271 diver hours underwater and 358 dives are recorded. That's 358 rows of data that we have collected from divers. So this is, that's just amazing that we're able to do that. And you can see how the accumulated effort is having an upward trend here. So, with the return of some areas of healthy kelp forest, you know, six southern sea otters that should threaten species have been able to return to Tankers Reef, and we, we see them every morning. Casey? Great. And so on this slide, you'll see the growth of our urch uh, urchinator population since last March. And for those of you who are not familiar, we have started calling our kelp restoration divers um, who have completed the certification course urchinators. Um, and so we also have over 300, you know, registered divers and counting as well. And so, you know, like Keith said, all of this work has been made possible by those 65 um, urchinators and we look forward to that number growing in the future. Next slide. And so for those of you who are registered but not yet certified, um, we have put together a list of instructors and dive shops that are offering the certification class. And if you use that link up in the right-hand corner, that'll take you to our website where you can find this exact table. Um, so please go ahead and take a look um, and also note that the prices vary uh, for the different shops and same with when they schedule the classes. So go ahead and take a look and see what works best for you. Next slide. And a little update on the Beach Hopper 2. Um, it is still on hold um, because they are waiting for a commercial fishing license to be issued by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, we know a lot of you folks are waiting to get on that boat to go out there and avoid that surface swim. So as soon as it is up and running, we will send out a newsletter. We'll post it on Facebook with the hopes that, you know, every Thursday she'll be taking out um, divers to go call some urchins. So the cost will be around 25 to 30 bucks, um, just enough to cover the costs for the uh, crew for the day. Next slide. And so a great way to get involved in this project is to come to one of our scheduled meetup days. Um, they're a great opportunity to meet other urchinators and even meet some new dive buddies. And you know, if you don't know anyone, that's great. You can still show up, we'll pair you off or Keith loves to dive with certified divers and show them the ropes, especially with things changing around outside of the grid. So. We have three more scheduled with one of them this Sunday. So we'd love to see you guys out there. Um, we do provide snacks and coffee and even some warm tomato soup in between dives. And it's also a great time for you to stop by and get one of the new project stickers. So 
We hope that's enough incentives for you. Um, the group does meet at Park Ave, and that's where you can unload your gear. If you can find a spot, great. Otherwise, they'll move your car to another spot, and then Keith will do a great briefing, and you guys will walk out together. Next slide. So yeah, we need more divers. Um, so if you're not a certified diver yet, please go take a look at that list of instructors. And if you are a certified diver, as in a kelp rest restoration certified diver, please come to a meetup. We'd love to hang out with you. Uh, next slide. And so for those of you who like where cost might be an issue, we do offer scholarships. Um, so we can help cover the cost of your training of the annual fishing license and the hammer. We just ask that you have a five dive commitment after your training. And we are limiting it right now to student and the military. So if you would like to be considered for a scholarship, please go ahead and send an email to info at g2kr.com and we will reach out to you to coordinate. Next steps, slide. And we also have set up a Golden Hammer program um, as a way to thank our volunteers and the urchinators. Um, so we've set up a tiered reward progress process. So if you vlog six dives, you'll get a cool t-shirt. Um, and if you vlog 10, you'll get one tanker's reef reservation on the beach hopper. And then if you vlog 20, you'll get two tanker's reservations on the beach hopper. Um, and so for those of you, once you qualify for a t-shirt, we'll reach out via email for your size and your address. Next slide. And so again, just pointing out all the awesome work that our originators have been doing. Um, we already have some people racking up some <laughs> charters on the beach hopper when eventually it is up and running. So Stephen will be good to go for a while, but please get out there and we'll reach out and get the t-shirts out. Next slide. And so we also do have a great social media presence. Um, if you aren't following us on Facebook, I really encourage you to follow the Facebook page. And we love to see your dive, see your dive reports. So if you post them on the Monterey Bay um, dive groups, or if you post it on our page, we'll share it around. We wanna hear about the work you did, about the conditions. Um, we'd love to see it. And we also have a newsletter. So go ahead and you can go to that link if you're not already signed up. That's where we'll put in a lot of announcements and any other great information about the project. Next slide. So of course we wanna say thank you to our collaborators and allies for those that make this work possible and have helped us throughout the way. And also noting um, we don't have the dive shops on here or the dive clubs, but they have been instrumental in education and outreach. So we really, really, really thank them as well. Next slide. And of course, um, people who have donated to the project, you guys have made this, really made it a lot better for us and helping with the scholarships and just the gear that it takes to get this project going. So thank you as well. Next, and like I said, for the fundraising, we, this is a pretty equipment, a equipment intensive project. So thank you for that. Next slide. And you can, these are all the links where you can, um, you can stay updated and we can post those in the chat as well, because that will probably be easier. All right, next. And at this point, we will go ahead and open it up for any questions or comments. We'll check the chat, Let's see. So Matthew, you're in town and want to help and AOWD diver, can you join this Sunday? Um, Keith, I'll let you take that question. Yeah, if you want to, on Sunday, we're doing a meetup uh, right there at Park Avenue. And uh, come join us. You know, we'll figure out the, if, if you're not trained uh, uh, urchin, urchinator, then yeah. you know, we can get you out on the gray buoy. You know, we can go out over there. It's, it's nearby. And okay. uh, we'll, we'll get you calling over there. Yeah, glad to have you. Come on out. I got a hammer for you. Perfect. Uh, what time is the meetup on Sunday as well? It's at eight o'clock. Eight o'clock at Park Avenue. Um, if you haven't been there before, it's kind of a, a strange little cul-de-sac uh, of a street. And there's limited parking there. But we have a big uh, tarp that we lay down and you can take all your gear out and just throw it on the tarp. Then go park your car on the other side of the street, park all day, doesn't cost nothing. Come back and go down. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, thank you.
All right, we have a question from Jeff. Uh, sounds like we are able to join you on 1010 prior to completing the certification course. Um, and then the second question is, what is the distance from the shore to the orange grape buoy? Um, the distance from the shore to the first buoy is, is 700 feet. So it's another, so it's a thousand feet to the other side of the grid. So that's about how far it is from the shore. It's about a thousand feet. So that would be like if you were at the breakwater and you started there and you swam on the surface all the way to the number 10 on the wall, maybe a little further because it starts for sand in the first hundred. So going to 11, you have to go all the way, kick to 11. And it's it's not, a, I mean, we, we do it all the time for sure. It's just, uh, uh, it feels like it's a long way because there's no reference. You can't look at the side and see the wall going by you. You just see condo minimums getting smaller. It's, you know, so, um, but it's, it's not bad. You know, it takes us 15 minutes to swim out there. Max depth of the grid. I see the question there. The fair question. Yeah, it at the uh, on the shallow end is 27 feet, and on the other end, the deep end, uh, further out from shore, it's 32 feet. So it doesn't vary very much. Um, it's all fairly shallow. Yeah, on a if it's a high tide, it'll be 35 feet or so. Is what you'll be into. And uh, it, the way to describe it is kind of like a, a really rocky substrate with like steps in it, but all those steps are kind of going down, right? The ledges are all um, facing to the south, but the whole thing is generally kind of tilted south, tilted um, offshore. So um, I don't know, it's a really neat place. And it's pretty flat, you know, generally just and the ledges are maybe a couple feet. There's not a lot of big rocks and boulders and things like that out there. Great. And Matthew, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm just curious. So I, I've been wanting to join in on this fund, and I don't have the training yet. And I'm curious about how much does it cost? And is that like up to the instructor and just, you know, ballpark? Yeah. It, it, is that one? I'm sorry? May I answer that one? Sure, Melanie. So, so I know one instructor does it for one hundred and twenty-five dollars because he's committed to to the the project, and he basically is kind of almost doing it for free. And then a couple of the other dive shops have it up to uh, like three hundred and twenty-five. Um, so it ends up to be close to four hundred with the fishing license and uh, that you have to buy. And then Matthew had asked, like, who is that person? And that's Randall Spangler um, from Diver Dance. Um, and they have a, they're running a wait list over there, but until the beach hopper is running, they're not going to go through their wait list. So, so there's options for you, you know, um, uh, and it depends on, you know, how you would like to be taught too. You know, each diver provides their own service in their own way. And we kind of give them the materials. It doesn't cost them anything to, you know, be uh, subscribed to the program or to be instructed in how to teach the program but um that is you know, it's up to them you know it's not our business to determine how much you know what they're going to charge for, for that kind of service all right and justin i see your hand up and then we'll go back to the chat questions yeah thank you it's a really neat project so i just want to thank everybody that's involved and um, I guess a two-part question. One is, are there any prereqs to take the training course? Is it open water, advanced open water? Do you need rescue diver or something like that? And then I guess two, what's the time frame? I don't live in the Monterey area. And so I'd travel, you know, to come take this course. And is it something that you can do in a day or is it a whole weekend or, or more or less? Or thanks. Very good. Great question. Yeah, this is, no, this is not a very, um, difficult like advanced topic that the access is really quite simple from shore and not big waves and stuff so we set the bar really low uh you all we need is not low but i mean at the an entry level right so an open water uh, student is is qualified to do this but what we try to encourage people is that you know they should be really comfortable diving in cold water you know um you know so we asked for like 20 dives diving in cold water in the last while here um, 
sometimes people, you know, they don't have that experience with the bigger wetsuits and all that kind of, um, and more weight and everything. So that, that's, that would be something you should be comfortable doing. It also helps if you're good at, um, you know, using a compass, another good skill. And a lot of this is about uh, buoyancy control and peak buoyancy control at, at that, because we don't want people to be dragging their their gear across the reef and, and harming things that way. So um, those are really the prerequisites uh, for, uh, for the course. Um, now what was the second question? What was it, Casey? Time frame, and that was a great well, time frame. Yeah, well, thank you. yeah, and the time frame. What, it, what the way it's set up is um, the way I can tell you how Aquarius teaches it. They they meet at the Moose Lodge on uh, Friday night, and they go through the whole course. It takes about two hours, and uh, then the next day, at some point, they they have uh, to do two dives on the reef, uh, and they just meet at Park Avenue. And they go out, on a, they have a scooter and they pull people out there. And uh, you dive, uh, one just kind of getting familiar with the, with the, the reef and how it, it, it points to control those things. And the second one, you're, you're, you're calling and counting uh, uh, urchins on the second dive. So you're really collecting data. And that includes all of the, you know, the, the nuances of how to get assignments and to um, report your data uh, accurately. So and then... Bamboo That's kind of your time commitment. And yeah, bamboo they're doing theirs in all one day. So there's, you don't have the night before. So that's why we encourage you to look at the different dive shops because they're all doing a little bit of their own spin on it. So depending on your time frame, you know, cost, whatever, just to take a look around. Um, and then another question is someone is interested in taking the course, but um, they're wondering if the project is suspect, um, expected to go on for some time. So is it worth it? Man, is it worth it? Yeah. It's really worth it because this project, you know, this, you know, I, I try not to get too grandiose about it, but, but this is the new way of the ocean. You know, the time in the past where, you know, we could just dive and look at things is kind of gone. You know, the ocean is going to need our stewardship. And so this project, um, we have permission to do this for the next three years uh, at Tankers Reef. But that is not where we're stopping. This is just uh, the project that we gain trust to get into other areas in the future. And we hope to get into state marine conservation areas um, and critical habitats, you know, in, on rocky granite substrates um, in the future. So, um, no, this is something that, uh, you know, we need to build an army to fight an army. And this is how we do that, by having this be something that people, that divers can get involved in and be useful, um, at, at doing this and protecting the things that they love. And um, so this, this is something that's gonna hopefully live beyond us. You know, I, I think ocean stewardship in, in a warming climate is just something that's is gonna be necessary for divers to do. Thanks for the okay. question. <laughs> All right, and then we have another question um, about if we do any work at Casper Cove. Um, John is organizing a group of free divers to go up there this weekend and cull urchins. And, in, and is wondering if there are any recommended ideal spots to focus on. Yes, I, I don't know too much about Casper Cove, only that um, it is a replicate of this project. That's the way the state considers them, that they have two pilot projects going on now with recreational divers. There's our effort here, where we have 350 rows of data, and the Casper Cove has like 40, right? And over a course of a year and a half. So there's there's it's not as popular of a place. It's up at a remote area from here. From, for me, it's six and a half hour drive to get there. Um, I, I, I've been to Mendocino, but not to Caspar. But um, yeah, I mean, my feeling is that a rising tide lifts all ships. If, if people are learning to do this and they're in the Bay Area, sure, go to Casper Cove and try it out over there and let us know, you know, show people there how, how it's done. They don't have this kind of a program there where we have, uh, you know, uh, divers that are in a, a, real, a real community funded and organized way. They just kind of meet up on Facebook uh, to do that kind of thing. So, but it's a great project. We'd love to, we'd love to see it succeed up there. You know, it's different. It's uh, bull kelp. And um, they had issues themselves with the park service, everything else. So we're all learning how to do this, you know, and the more that we can learn, the, the, the more useful the tool we can make this and uh, develop. Um, and then we did have a question about the 
if the fishing license was an annual fee. And so I know that you can either purchase the annual one for around 56 to 60 bucks, or you can purchase a day one yeah. for 17. Right. Um, right. And yeah. The annual license is like $51 and 66 cents or something like that. It goes up a percentage every year. Uh, and it is only good until the end of this year till, um, Open point. This, yeah. End of, yeah. So you have to start it again next year and have another one. Um, and, and we asked that question, you know, how many people that are, when you register, how many people already have a license? So some people get a license anyways, and some people have to get a new one. Um, you know, and, and we get to go to fish and wildlife and say, Hey, we're paying your way. You know, we, we are, we are paying our own way in this project and we're buying, we're paying for uh, fish and wildlife to get involved. So, um, it's all good. You know, I mean, we can't bribe them. So uh, maybe this will help convince them that, that we're, we're invested in this. Great. And then we had a question about um, if folks need previous experience diving in cold water. And I think you touched upon that one a little bit before in the earlier one, but maybe hitting on those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, cold water is, is the thing, right, with Monterey. You know, Monterey is really world-renowned for its uh, pristine kelp forest, you know, in, in cold water. And, and uh, you know, our water temperature usually ranges from 50 to 55 degrees, and you should be comfortable diving in that in a wetsuit, you know, and that takes some experience um, to, to be, uh, be comfortable with that. And then another question, do you need to take the course or the kelp restoration diver course if you are an AAUS diver? Um, for AAUS diver, I don't have another program for AAUS divers separate from this. But if you are a reef check person, if you are, um, a lot of people um, have done reef check in the past. If, if you're a certified reef check diver, there is a, a, a short course that you can do um, through Dan Abbott, and Dan Abbott and I uh, did a um, uh, hour and a half session on it, and you can view that, and then um, Dan Abbott can certify you as a reef check person um, to be on the site because reef check divers already have a qualification; they have an eco diver card, and so they're well qualified to do this kind of thing. They love to count, so but but AAUS, di AAUS divers like to count too, but. Um, uh, you'll have to come in through uh, through a, uh, the kelp restoration specialty course through uh, it's a patty or now of course you have to come in that way uh, to the course okay um and from jeff he said if you'd like we could present this exact presentation to the sf scuba club i'm one of the key organizers there and i think we could pick up a few volunteers let me know if that's of interest all right that's your court casey yeah so jeff <laughs> um <laughs> we'll, we'll put a note to reach out to you after this um Great. If you could post your email, and we'll talk to you about that. Okay. Um, someone else asked if this video will be posted online, and we are recording it, so we will we'll get it up online for the folks who maybe couldn't get that passcode. There's always right a recording. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then Paul brought up that there's currently a state assembly bill to open MPAs to restoration efforts. Mm, great point, Paul. Yeah, that's a part of our political. I mean, I, I mean we're calling urchins, right? So we, I mean. They told me no like three times, right? But it doesn't, let's, you know, here we are today calling urchins, right? So the way we do that is through this political process of public pressure. That's the only thing that really works. I went there before and just, you know, by the, I thought that the cause was so good that they would just relent, but they didn't. And you'll, you'll see that, um, you know, to do a political, to do, to get the next step, we need to do a political campaign to make it possible for us to scale up our efforts and expand into the state marine conservation areas next year. And to do that, we've been working really hard at getting an assembly bill passed. It's called AB 63. And it has already passed through the California uh, Assembly and the Senate. It is now on the governor's desk. And what this bill does is it makes it so that it, it adds three words <laughs> to the language of the state marine conservation area um, allowed activities and makes restoration and monitoring an allowable activity inside the state marine conservation areas. It's kind of crazy that it does, it's not allowed now. I mean, if there was an oil spill, we could not do restoration by their own rules. It's, it's kind of nuts, but the reserves have that language. So we're, we're fixing the language because 
the Department of Fish and Wildlife has held up that language as being a reason that they can't allow us to do what we need to do. So we need that rule. Uh, we can certainly send, uh, you know, we'll send out in a newsletter the, um, the petition that get the governor to sign it and then uh, we'll take off. And there's other kinds of stuff coming up too. We have this, uh, the MPA decadal review is coming up and there are meetings that are coming up in uh, October and November for people to attend and listen to how people view the, the marine protected areas and how is there a way that we can do real work in them in, in terms of restoration. And, and that's, that's a big thing. It happens every 10 years. Um, this is the first one. And, uh, but in, in Central Coast, we've been, you know, we, our, our marine protected areas have been here for 15 years. So, you know, we're, we're in the eighth year of this crisis here. And so we really need to, uh, you know, hear your voices at these meetings you know, from what you've seen, because they don't get it, right? I mean, they're land lovers. They look at the surface of the ocean. You know, we've seen what it's, what it's like under the water. And those of you that have dove for any length of time can really appreciate what's happened and how we need to fix that. Very well said. And end of rant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and oh, where did that question go? We had a question about just describing the process. Are we removing or destroying the urchins? Also, is the membrane apora worse than usual or is the damage you described typical? Wow, awesome, thank you. Yeah, the, uh, I'll take the second part first. The membrane apora is kind of early. You know, I mean, it's been 60 degree water out there at Tankers Reef for the last month and that bright zone is just all over everything. And we've watched it kind of, it, I think it's normal, but it's just kind of early, you know, it's September now, it, that doesn't usually come till later. Um, so yeah, that's a change. And um, the process we're using is is a, a hammer. So, so this is, I mean, you can see this here, it's on this side. This is the hammer that we are using on the job. It is a welding hammer and it has a, a pointy end on, on, on this end and a chisel on the other end. And on that, what we're using that for is that at this place uh, that we're working at Tanker Street, this is the ideal tool. Uh, it has um, this nice chisel end. You can get the urchins when they're kind of out in the open. And then if they're in a smaller little holes, you turn it around and get them with the small end right there. And a lot of times uh, they're on the kelp and uh, you go through and, and get them with the small end. And uh, they, they like to burrow into the holdfast of the kelp and they'll kind of go back and forth, round and round and make like a little tunnel into the side of the holdfast. And if you put your light on them, you'll light them up and you can see with the pointy end, you just kind of go, because the holdfast will grow over them. So you'll see like through the holdfast, there's something underneath it. And you just put this in there and scramble them up a little bit. So, um, so that's the process of doing it. You know, we're destroying them underwater, trying to make sure that they don't survive that. They, if, uh, if you damage them really thoroughly, then that, that urchin will not survive. They'll die from infections. But if you make a small hole, then that urchin could survive for a week. And that whole time is just eating more kelp. So we wanna make sure and, 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 and uh, kill all the urchins and um, not all the urchins, but kill the ones that, that we can without harming other marine life. That's the critical piece to this is um, we don't wanna damage starfish and other things that could be in and around these urchins. So being really careful and, and, and going through it that way. Um, yeah, and the result of that is fish have come around when we're calling and they're just eating everything. It doesn't go to waste. It's not like um, it's, it's trash, right? I mean, when you start on one end of a reef and you start going down the line and you go, oh, I'm gonna go back and double check. I need to go back, there's fish already there. They're already eating it right out of the, the, right out of the shells. They're eating what gonad is left. And then the sand dabs come and a rainbow perch come. Those are great, they're beautiful fish. And um, the little uh, the black eyed gobies and cinderitas, love that stuff. And, um, and, and, and the whole fish population has improved. And then the predators have moved in too. We've seen lingcod and, and um, we saw a leopard shark the other day that's come in for these fish as well. You know, the fish population increased dramatically. And then, then the, the, the sea stars come and eat the carcasses further. And uh, after we come back two weeks later, there's nothing left but little white shells. And so, it came from the ocean, it returns to the ocean. And um, 
you know, that's, that's how it should be, I think. All right, great. Um, we have someone asking if you can send images of the invasive species that you want them to know. Um, we can post those. Yeah, they're, they're in with the training. Uh, there's two invasive species that we are looking for. Um, there's water cipra, which is a like a red rust bryzone. It's like, just like red potato chips that's on the rock. And we have it in a couple places. We know it's there. Um, and we're going to keep an eye on it because it's, uh, it, it is, um, you know, it, it, urchins eat it. So if we, we take out, if we kill the urchins, then there will be more water cipra. And so we want to keep an eye on that particular one. And, and sargassum, which is the scourge of Southern California was spotted this last, last year at, uh, at the breakwater. So we are on the lookout for that. And there is a lookalike to Stephanocystis, which kind of looks like um, Sargassum horneri, but it is, it is different. And we can show you the difference between those two. So we don't get um, false positives for that, uh, for that invasive. Great. Um, and we did have another comment from someone who on their assignment yesterday, it wasn't quite clear about what they were supposed to do on the orange buoy. So maybe taking those two slides where we describe that process, sure. making it a little bit more clear because you described it really well during this meeting. But for the folks who took the class and learned it, about it on the grid, right. um, it would be helpful for them to see that, that slide if they didn't come tonight. So thank you, Scott, for that suggestion. Um, so we'll take these two and we'll, we'll take this information. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, on the grid was different, but on the orange buoy, uh, what you're gonna do is come to the, to the orange buoy, you go down the line, right? And also on that line, there's a bunch of hammers clipped into the, to the, to the uh, chain. So if you happen to forget your hammer or drop it on the way out there, don't turn around, go back, keep coming. They're on the, they're on the line. So you come down the line and your assignment is going to be, it'll say a number that you'll start on the tape measure and it'll say east or west. So you'll come down and it'll say on the assignment that your, your lanes are between five and 10 meters. So you'll find that spot on the tape and then you will go east or west. So this, this, in this example, it's going east and you're just going to go out and be careful and thorough and call the urchins as you generally head east. There are no, there's no imaginary lines for you to cross over, you know, uh, and, uh, but you're going to, you'll know when you're in or you're out of it because there will be cold urchins um, in the other areas or not, or, or um, there'll be urchins that are uncold and that'll help you define for yourself you know, which way you're, um, you're going in, in, in that, in that general direction. Um, and when you do that, don't, you'll find ones that were missed, that someone went over them before, perhaps, or maybe uh, uh, one earlier time, there were some that were overlooked, and then go ahead and get those too. But you, you want to try and move through the areas that are already cold as quickly as you can before you get to to the areas where they haven't been called. And so that goes back to the importance of being really thorough when you call the urchin so that it's recognizable that it's been called and not just like a single hole in it that is, you know, it's not an effective call. And that way, um, if it, someone else might not see the single hole and go get them again. And that's the wasted effort. And we wanna make the best use of everyone's time and not be that inefficient in, in calling uh, dead urchins. That I think that answers the question. Hey Keith. Yeah. Yes. You want to speak to how they hide? How they hide is uh yeah thanks Paul yeah the urchins hide uh, right in plain sight you know they're they're it, the urchins are live in little cracks right that's their preferred way to go there's little ledges there and there's little cracks and there are little holes there where they did or their ancestor went and burrowed a little hole into that rock. And what you don't, what you, you don't see it though, because there is kelp that is drift, red algae or uh, brown algae that uh, drift and they grab a hold of it, their little petal area on top of their head, they grip it and then they bring it around to their mouth and they eat it. So what you're looking for is that there's, there's uh, kelp there that doesn't look right. It's not moving right, right? Like you look at it and go, well, 
that shouldn't be there. That shouldn't be attached to anything, right? And then uh, it's just like a big neon sign saying, you know, I'm an urchin, I'm right here and I eat this, right? So that's how you know it's there. And then you just take it and pull it out, pull the, the kelp out of its, uh, away from them and that exposes them all. You don't wanna try and swing through it and, and kill whatever's holding on to that. It could be something else. It could be a masking crab, right? So be really careful in that and, and pull that off and you know, never swing your, your hammer where, where you can't see the tip of what you're hitting, right? So that means you're not, you don't want to climb underneath ledges and, and you know, put your tank out on the other side and just go in there and try to get as deep as you can. That's fine. You know, those urchins can we'll get them another day. You know, the red urchins go really deep and they're going to come out every night anyway. So we'll get them another time when they're out and about. All right. Great. Um, someone asked if G2KR is a 501c3 and how many tanks slash dives are typically done on an assignment? Uh, we are not a 501c3, but we aspire to be one uh, for play for next year. And uh, we'll have to see who, who we can, uh, how this progresses. If we can get permission, then we'll pull the trigger on that. Uh, right now we have a fiscal sponsor. That's Nancy Crusoe with Get Inspired. Uh, if, if people want to donate and get a tax deduction, we can do it that way. Uh, we've done that lots of times. Um, and, and brought money in that way. So um, we will be, it mm -hmm. has to be, yes. Hi, this is Warren Noah. Um, if you're looking to become 501c3, uh, give me a call, I'll help you out with that. I'm an attorney and I've done it in the past. You got it, thanks Warren, I'm a big fan. No problem, <laughs> want to be able to help. Appreciate it. Um. And then in the chat, some folks were talking about um, if they have found some urchins with sufficient uni that they could use for culinary applications. And some are saying they haven't quite found that much inside in some. Yeah, I, I have been, um, in addition to everything else, I've been pulling urchins off the reef and dissecting them in a lab and weighing their inside to see how their health is. And what we found is that the urchins are getting less healthy on this reef. Um, in, in February, they were like 7% uh, gonad to body weight, and now they're like 3% uh, gonad to body weight. So they've, they've exhausted the resource, especially on the southern part of the grid. And so there is not a lot of uni to be had in, in these ones. Even the red urchins that are living under the ledges and come out at night, uh, they're not full too. I, I've been testing them, and, and they can get as high as 8 or 9%, but that's... Um, for their size too, it's not considered um, sufficient. You know, we have a red urchin fisherman that wanted to pull them out. And that's a whole other venture that we're gonna work on and put purple urchins into ranching. And the urchins were, were not, they were garbage is what he said. And we just had a question come in saying, as I recall, culling should be suspended during certain times of the year. Could you mm. clarify? Yeah, good one. Yeah. because. Um, you know, urchins spawn in uh, February and March is kind of the, that's when they spawn. So um, we will not be calling during that time. So we're going to go as uh, we have meetups planned through October. And so we'll plan on, you know, um, diving at least through October. But then it's be like weather dependent. We might go out a couple of times after that and do some things. But then we'll just stop and we'll pick it up again in, in the spring. Uh, give those urchins that are... Um, that are um, have that potential. Uh, let's leave them alone during that time, and uh, we don't exacerbate the problem by uh, having more urchin calling at that time, having more urchin spawning event at that time. It even includes urchin ranching because if we put urchins into a place and we rehabilitate them with kelp, we have to make sure that population is gone by the time that, uh, that it, uh, in February March roll around. Uh, we'll have to make sure that. Uh, they exhaust that that supply. Is that enough? I, I feel like I'm hinting at urchin ranching program and not telling you, but we are planning to do something like that. We think this might be a, you know, some more ethical way to for human consumption. If we could take the urchins that are in poor, poor shape and bring them into um, an urchin rehabilitation program, they're very resilient. And in 10 weeks, 
they can become a marketable product that sells for nine dollars each right so there's a product is a when these fisheries are driven by profits and there's profit to be made it's actually more profitable to do that than perhaps abalone so the abalone farm is actually doing an, um, a ranching project in uh, they have a barge out there in the harbor and we're helping to facilitate that with some of our red urchin fishermen friends from santa barbara so um, hopefully we'll get that going uh, uh, in, in the future too all right well i think that is everything in the chat um, do folks have any more questions or comments or anything that I missed in the chat? I guess we should write letters to the governor. <laughs> I, I will send out a, a link to the petition that uh, you can sign up. We'd love to get some help with this. You know, the, the more the merrier. Last time at the Fish and Game Commission, we had 260 letters, and that's what that's what took it over the line. You know, you guys, you guys know how to how to express your feelings, and we'd like to hear that too. And so, yes, that will help us. And uh, I'll, I'll send everybody the link in a newsletter. Thanks for that. Sounds like Barbara. No, it's oh, Kate. Oh, hi, Kate. <laughs> oh, and there was one more question, Keith, about how many tanks slash dives um, should they expect for an assignment. Oh, well, for the meetup, uh, we just, we do two tanks. You can do as many as you like, you know, uh, if you come, you know, I know uh, Amelie and uh, Kevin come out, do one dive and then they go they have lunch, you know, or enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, it's whatever you, whatever you like to do, what you're comfortable doing, you know, we, we just, we just ask that whenever you do that, that you report the data. Um, this is Kate. Again, I just, okay. so, we, if we're not yet certified, we could come and dive this, we could join a meetup and dive yeah. gray buoy. Yes, you come come out on Sunday. Okay, well, can't come this weekend, but it's okay. the, oh, another one. next weekend or the, the third uh, of October? Two weeks after that. It's every two weeks on our, okay. on our calendar. Here. But yeah, yeah, come out and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll get you situated. Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's I got my license muffins. already, but finding instruction is... Yeah, it's a little difficult. It's a difficult at this point. There's, we'll figure something out. You know, we have this little. Uh, well, it's kind of a silly rule, but the we we're able to use the beach hopper. We're scheduling stuff on the beach hopper, and, and we have like a loophole that we're trying to do. It's kind of strange where you, you, you're on the beach hopper, and then you step onto a raft that's privately owned, and then you go in the water. <laughs> so, but it's it's just kind of bizarre. We'll get it. We'll get it fixed. Yep. So, and Melanie, you raised your hand. Keith, if someone shows up that's untrained on Sunday, are you planning on going out with that group to make sure that they know what they're doing? Yes, uh, I always go out with the group on Sunday and no, I'll I mean, brief everybody and, and I'll, I'll sum out with, with the people to the gray buoy. Okay, so you, you would take them to the gray buoy so they knew where, what was going on? Yes. I will. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And then just to clarify for those divers, you, you can't go out on your own until you have taken the certification class. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, as far as going to the orange buoy and to the grid, that is following a, a certification class where you'll learn how to input the data and, and, and all of that. Uh, yeah, that's correct. All right. Do we... Oh, Paul said, if you're traveling from out of town... Rent tanks at your local shops, rental gear in Monterey is often sold out. So good point, Paul, for those yeah, that are traveling. Yeah. Or call ahead and reserve gear too if if you have time. Right. And then another question about um, were you surprised at how fast the grid was cleared? Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> when we first were talking to the authorities about this, they, they thought well, you're just going to clear one lane. Like maybe you clear half a lane and then we'll come in and, and count it after you're done. And I'm like, you're just not totally, we're on different pages here because they're thinking that maybe we clear like like half an acre. And I'm like, I'm thinking we're going to clear like in the course of three years, like 50 acres. You know, we just had a total different concept of what we were doing. And so um, I, I I thought we could clear it and uh, in that in that amount of time. But I was just really surprised and just delighted how many people that came in the program. Every time I see divers coming out there, it just but just a smile on my face, you know, that that, you know, it, it's really happening. 
you know, and we're really getting the, the, it done in that amount of time, you know, um, that we did, you know, it's, this is, you know, four, four months, we did what they thought would take us three years to do. So, uh, bravo. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, that, the main, you know, kind of what the goal came down to is, you know, let's just go, you know, let's just go show them. Let's just go kick ass. And that will help them to, you know, trust us that we can do this really well in rain protected areas. Great. And Matthew, your hand is raised. Hey, yeah, I, I was just thinking, um, <clears throat> so just kind of generally speaking, is it worth going out and uh, going to the untrained diver buoy if I'm like kind of waiting for a class to become available? Like, is that, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, like, yeah, in your like opinion, what, is it helpful to do it untrained or should I wait till I- No, I, I, I think that's valid. I, I think it, it, anything you can you can do and, and you'll get more familiar with it, that'll make the class easier for you, I would think. You know, if you if you get some experience for what it's like out there, what it's like to you know swing a hammer swing a hammer underwater, and then when you get to the class, it'll just make it better for you. I, I would recommend you do that. That that would be good to do. Um, if if you're if you think you're going to do it, you know, and not you know soon, whatever, that'd be fine. Good idea. Cool. And and the, where where it is really is just the gray <laughs> buoy is on a really dense yeah. area. There's a lot of urchins out there. It's a target-rich environment, and uh, you'll you'll get you'll get your uh, fishing licenses worth of urchins there, no problem. Cool, thanks. All right, thanks. and Melanie. So Keith, it, for divers that are untrained, mm -hmm. uh, like Matthew was just talking about, are you going to show them? how to not harm other organisms as they're hammering out there? Yes, there's, they there's haven't a, had the training. Yeah, there, there's a separate uh, uh, data portal for the gray buoy and I'll, I'll guide people with that at the briefing, how to go through that. It's, and if you go to the g2krlink.com um, uh, page, uh, those links are available there for how to go and get an assignment on the gray buoy. And it explains in a short document you know, the things you're, that you're going to do um, on, on the great boot. And, and uh, yeah, and at the briefing on the meetup, if someone comes to the meetup, I'll, I'll explain it to them then also. And take them out there. All right. And Tim? Yeah, one of my questions was already answered. Um, the other one I have is, uh, do you have, like, hammers available, or where can we get them? Great question. Yeah. Uh, these hammers are available at your Home Depot, your Amazon, and uh, uh, also Harbor Freight has one that's really good. It's like six bucks. And, oh, and uh, some and of the local dive shops have them too. Yes. And the local dive shops, Aquarius has them on the wall and Bamboo Reef has them also. And Pro Scuba has them. You can buy them there. It's just like a convenient uh, convenience for you to buy them right there. I think that we we asked them not to sell them for $15 uh, at, at the dive shops and get a nice little clip for the end uh, and uh, uh, bring on there. But if, if you're going to go to the untrained uh, and it's, it, the beach hopper also, and the beach hopper, you won't be allowed to bring your hammer on board. Uh, we're just going to have the hammers already there on the buoy at the bottom. So we're not to have hammers on the boat swinging around and all that stuff. Right? You got okay. enough gear, Tim. <laughs> Where do you secure your hammer when you're not swinging it? Yeah, it, you attach it to yourself, but you, you don't you don't want to make it so it's dangling down, right? You don't want it to be hanging out below you and catching on things, catching your buddy. So um, a lot of times we have, like, I'll do it differently and, and attach the, uh, the clip here and it'll be hanging on a D-ring up in this position right here. That's how you, that's how you do it. This one here was actually, um, uh, no, Brett is here, but Brett had lost this. He did not have anything attached to this and we found it on the grid. So um, if somebody wants a, ha a hammer, it comes to the meetup, I will give you this hammer. <laughs> right, any other questions or comments?
hopefully we will see you guys at our meetup day this Sunday. Um, oh, Mike asked if anyone does any calling at night and if it's worth it. I have never done it at night. I You could, but you know, I mean, is it safe to do so? You have to make that decision, right? Um, if it's safe to go out there at night. I think it'd be interesting because you see a lot more red urchins coming out from under the ledges and running across, but um, take a picture of it. I don't know. It might be interesting to see that, that kind of behavior. Um, but um, there's no time limit. There's no um, hours of operation or anything like that. It's all through the assignment, through the assignment portal. So it's kind of a self-guided tour and self-guided reporting. Uh, and it's been going really well. We're, get, we're capturing the data. And so I encourage you to do that. Hey, Keith. Yes. Can you, can you speak to the importance of following the rules? Yeah, that's kind of the big thing, right? Is, thanks for that, Paul, because we are trying to get into the marine protected areas in the future. And the last thing we need is for someone to go into the marine protected areas and get busted, you know, coming out with a hammer or, you know, getting, you know, it's not that enforceable, but, you know, people see people and you would, you don't, you don't want to like, oh, look, I, I called a bunch of urchins over here at, uh, at Point Lobos or something, post it up on Facebook, because then, the department is really going to they'll have no choice but to come after you. And, and that'll, that'll put the kibosh on the whole project and everybody who's worked on it. You know, we all worked really hard at this and we're trying to, you know, we're accountable to each other. So, so please, please be really careful and just be patient. We will get there. And the, with that, the importance of the certification courses, you know, making sure you take those. Um, and yeah. Yeah. And it's also important too to speak out when you do see those posts on social media. Yeah, shut them down. You see someone saying something that doesn't belong. Hey, I, I, I got a bunch of virgins at a uh, monastery. You know, say, hey, dude, don't, don't do that. Shut it down before. You know, the, you know, the, the long arm of the law is not. They don't, they don't really have their ear out so much to Facebook, but they could. And all it takes is for, for something to, to, like that to happen. And, and we'll all get, we'll, then we'll lose our opportunity that we all worked so hard to gain. So please be careful. Don't do that. All right. And with that, I think it's time to wrap up. Very good. Thank you, everybody. And thanks for... For all you've done and all you will do, and uh, you know it's, it's great to uh, to to be able to to uh, uh, share this up, share this with you, and um, we look forward to uh, really doing well in the future. And so, thank you all. And uh, we'll, we'll, we're, <laughs> I just I'm speechless at how how I'm just having the time of my life. I'm just loving this. This is just great, and um, and it's all because of this community uh, outreach and support and. And, um, and we're all working together for a common goal. It's just a beautiful thing. So thank you. Yep. And with that, check out the Facebook page for the meetup days so you can see you in person and not over Zoom. Uh, sign up for the newsletters and reach out if you have any other questions. Okay. Awesome. Have a great evening.